Hello, everyone. I'm Clayton Chastain, and this is a very special episode of the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. Today, we get to celebrate our 100th episode, a significant milestone in our journey of sharing cutting-edge insights and discussions with top minds in the swine nutrition industry. First and foremost, a heartfelt thank you to each one of you, our dedicated listeners, for your unwavering support. It has been a pleasure having been your host for these past 100 episodes, and I'm greatly looking forward to continuing to provide you with the latest developments in swine nutrition research. Your enthusiasm for animal nutrition drives us to be the world's premier resource in this field. Together, we've built a distinguished community of experts where innovation and technical prowess are at the forefront. In this special episode, we'll take a brief look back at some of our top episodes that have resonated with you and our audience of swine nutritionists, producers, and decision makers in animal production. First up, let's look back at episode 15 with Dr. Ruard Zilstra, where we discuss the energy potential of various grains and swine feed. Dr. Zilstra's insights into digestible and fermentable fractions of grains have been pivotal in redefining how we predict net energy in feedstuffs. One of the things we're interested in is um, whatever this difference that we determine is in grower uh, finisher pigs, how well does that describe what is happening in nursery pigs? And so in grower finisher pigs, they have a mature gastrointestinal tract. Uh, in other words, their uh, enzyme systems in the, in the small intestine are fully functional. Their microbiome has been fully established in the, in the small and the large intestine. But in the nursery pig, that's not the case yet. And so one of our next things would be to see if the same difference applies in the nursery pig and uh, to the same extent uh, when, the, when the gastrointestinal tract is, uh, is less mature. And um, so we've done some research over the years and nursery pigs as well. In episode 39, we had an enlightening conversation with Garen Shipman about fiber's role in nutrient digestibility for gestating sows. His research on dietary fiber levels and carbohydrate mixtures provided valuable insights into amino acid digestibility and the total fermentation capacity of the sound's hindgut. So from this study, um, we saw that compared that the sows, the enzyme inclusion, the enzymes did, ha- did increase nutrient, dis- nutrient disability on a parent total track level as well as that for the grower pigs. However, when we looked at the um, non starch polysaccharides components, so the hemicellulose components of the NDF, we saw that the enzymes did increase uh, NSP digestibility for the grower pigs. However, it did not increase, did not have an effect on the, for the gasane sows. Remember episode 45 with Dr. Dan Columbus? We explored the complexities of low-protein diets and swine nutrition. Dr. Columbus's study on lysine requirements and non-protein nitrogen sources was a game-changer for understanding protein reduction strategies. So I think the main benefit is just the more efficient utilization of the feed and optimizing that lean gain, right? If you're not going to provide enough nitrogen and you're adding lysine and you're not getting the, the, the greatest lean gain that you can get, or the greatest efficiency of that lysine utilization, which is going to end up costing money uh, in the long run. Um, with regards to the ammonium phosphate itself, uh, products like urea and, and the ammonium phosphate are actually quite a bit more expensive than traditional protein sources. Um, but where they become a benefit is you have to add significantly less of them to achieve the same increase in crude protein or nitrogen content in your diet that you would save for soybean meal. So overall, they do save quite a bit. Episode 83 was another highlight, featuring Dr. Lee Johnston's research on zinc supplementation in swine diets. His findings on high-level zinc supplementation for gestating sows have significantly impacted swine nutrition practices. Right now, Kelsey is working through some mass balance calculations and some LCA um, calculations to try to quantify, okay, yeah, there might be more zinc being excreted, but you also, on the other end, get more product, and maybe that's a benefit to mitigate some of those zinc risks, risks in the environment. So um, the jury's still out on that. Um, so we're thinking that if we can focus in on the timing of when that zinc can be fed, 
that that might help uh, mitigate some of the environmental concerns. So it's not synced the whole way through, but maybe in strategic times. And that's what Kelsey's study was designed to do, is to look at overall gestation versus one concentrated period. And who can forget episode 84 with Dr. Jordan Gebhardt? His expertise in swine nutrition research and experimental design offered invaluable insights into understanding and managing experimental units in research settings. And then one of the other key areas that I see in terms of experimental design is we have a a tendency and a pattern to try to answer too many questions within an experiment, making our treatment structure too complicated. It's only adding on one more treatment. We can do that. But it's really, really important to make sure we do a thorough job with our sample size calculations and making sure we're being realistic with our expectations. Do we have an appropriate treatment structure for our facility limitations to give us a reasonable expectation of finding treatment differences if they're there? We have a pattern and we have a tendency to try to answer too many questions and be efficient, but sometimes that can give us results that really don't answer any of our questions. So making sure we're, we're very realistic with our expectations is critical as it relates to sample size calculations and how many treatments we can include. Lastly, episode 92 with Dr. Arnon Cordova from Smithfield Foods delved into the world of trypsin inhibitors and swine nutrition. This episode was a treasure trove of strategies and studies for optimizing feed efficiency. So that's where the importance of these trypsin inhibitors, why they are so important for, for, for on that perspective of animal nutrition, right? Because you're being less efficient, you can impair growth rate, you can impair pancreatic activity because of that. So uh, basically, and especially in young animals, as their GI tract, as their gut is not, is an immature gut, then normally you will see uh, uh, bigger impacts, negative impacts in those, in those animals. As we continue to grow and evolve, our commitment remains strong to provide you with the latest research and technical discussions that matter most in swine nutrition. Here's to many more episodes of learning, innovation, and community building. Thank you for being a part of our journey and for contributing to the success of the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. Stay tuned for more insightful episodes and remember, let's keep driving the future of swine nutrition together. Hey everyone, we're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine nutrition related research trial and would like to come on the show and share it with us, feel free to email the details about your research to hello at wisenetics.com.